thank you very much for joining us on Hope TV, where you look and live. And on today's edition of Testify, where our faith gets to grow every day. I am Sharon Aitori Wangani, and I am so glad that you're tuned in today because you are in for an amazing testimony of the doing of the Lord. Today, I host evangelist Susan Atieno. She tells us the story of how the Lord, you know, brought her out of interesting, I don't know the words to use. She will just help us understand what the Lord has done in her life. So Karim Sana, thank you, Susan, so thank we are you. glad to have you on Hope TV. And uh, we are very eager to hear your story. I've heard a bit of it already. And I'm encouraged to know what the Lord can do. So now we'll start with the very basics, the introduction. Amen. Thank you so much for having me uh, at Top TV. And um, uh, I'm really uh, glad that God can use me to just be an encouragement to somebody out there. My name is her evangelist, Susan Atieno. And uh, I'm a woman who is forgiven much. And I'm here to just speak to us through my story. And sometimes many people ask me, why do you need to tell us what you went through? We don't need to hear those deep stuff mm -hmm. of uh, what you went through. But uh, my testimony is my ministry because for the Lord to save me and to deliver me, he had a purpose. And I'm so, I usually get encouraged by the story of uh, the mad man from, uh, in the book of Mark chapter 5, mm -hmm. verse 1 and 20 that even in his madness, Jesus, Jesus had a purpose. And the Bible says that when Jesus visited him and he was delivered from the legions that he had, he wanted to follow Jesus, but Jesus told him, go and tell, mm. go back home and tell. And we see out of his testimony, 20 cities were delivered. So I look at myself like the madman in the book of Mark chapter five, verse one and 20. And I see myself as a woman who had many legions. And Jesus visiting me through that man who came to preach to me, and you'll hear the story, and delivered me. He sent me back to go and tell. Mm -hmm. And I know there are cities today that are waiting to hear my story. There are nations that are waiting to hear my story. And somebody will be encouraged. Mm -hmm. And the name of the Lord will be glorified. Amen. Amen. So, so let's start with uh, uh, Susan as a young girl, yeah. growing up. Where did you grow up and how was it like growing up? Okay, um, talking about my growing up, uh, I was brought up by a single mom. And uh, as I hear from her and of also from my grandma, my mom uh, gave birth to me when she was 16 years. Mm -hmm. And they separated with my dad, I think, before uh, my mom gave birth to me. And mom, coming from a very poor background, she was not able to take care, care of me uh, because she didn't have education and she didn't have a job. So eventually, when I was six months of age, she left me with my grandmother. So she went out there looking for jobs. And how without papers, what other job at that very particular time could she have maybe looked for? So. She looked for a, house, uh, for, for a job as a, as a barmaid, and uh, this is where she started also her journey uh, as, a, as a young girl trying to make ends meet. And, you know, occasionally she could come visit us and my grandmother, and when she was able really to make uh, good money, she took me in and we started living together. Uh, in the slums of Karibani. This is where I was uh, brought up as a young girl. Mm -hmm. So living in the environs of Karibangi, it's a slum. And uh, you know what happens uh, in, in slums. Many times you'll find that uh, children who grow in, in, in slum areas, they are, you know, they are exposed to you know, danger of getting into drug addiction, molestation, uh, name it. And uh, those are kind of the things as a young girl I went through. Uh, but by the grace of God, I was able to go through school, but really having encountered uh, different kind of things that really were not of, uh, that, that, that really uh, made me even to become who I did, did uh, become in future. 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What are some of these things that you went through? Would you would you want to share some of these <laughs> things with us? You know. Wow. Um, yeah, as a as a young girl living with a with a woman who is uh, going out there to to make the ends meet, and what she's doing, she's going at night, and you're left uh, sometimes all by yourself. You and were the only child. I was. At this I'm the only child. Yeah. And there, this this neighborhood, and you know, in the slum area. Uh, you, <laughs> the way the way the houses are, or rather the way the neighborhood is, yeah. is like the houses are so much together, and the the neighborhood that you find, the people that you interact with, are people who are in drugs, people in, who are in prostitution. You'll find the, your neighbor is the one who is selling, you know, the illicit brew uh, to the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So you're exposed even to molestation. You're exposed even to. It being introduced to taking the drugs, you're, in, you're exposed even to drinking the same stuff yourself. So those things really I encountered as a young girl. Mm -hmm. uh, but by the grace of God, somehow we survived. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> somehow we found, we found ourselves just going through the journey yeah. and surviving. And I do believe by the grace of God, we, God protected us, protected us. Also, although being hurt, by what we went through and even not doing ourselves and also embracing what was happening and th thinking this is the real deal this is how life is mm -hmm. yeah. so you had to accept that as life because what uh, what other life do you know this yeah. is happening to almost, almost every, everyone. everyone yeah uh you know what what other life do you know? At that particular point, your story is not unique to the people around you. It is not something that you'll be shocked. Yeah. Or your neighbor will be shocked hearing that this is what you have gone through. Mm -hmm. It's norm. It's norm to the neighbor. Yeah. It's norm to your friends. Yeah. So how, you said you managed to go through primary school. Yes, I did manage to go through primary school. Mm -hmm. uh, I also did manage to go to high school. And it is in high school that uh, when I was in Form 2, I asked my, my mom who my dad was. I wanted to know my identity, mm -hmm. like any other child would want to know where am I, who, who am I. But my, my grandma had somehow, you know, uh, told me about it when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. And she told me, don't tell, tell your mom about it, that I have told you, but you, your dad is a loo and uh, they met with your mom at this when your mom was this particular age and uh, your dad has been looking for you but your mom has been hiding you so i was curious to get to know who is who is my dad mm -hmm. yeah who is he you know and as a as a girl i really wanted to know where am i coming coming from and who is my father yeah so when i was in form two i was able to really push it it was not something that uh, went well with her she was not happy about it but nevertheless, I, I, I did give her rest. I continuously asked her, who is my dad? I'd like you to tell me who my dad is. And uh, she gave me his address. Mm. And at that very particular time, my dad was a very senior person uh, in the government. He was working uh, for the mini with the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs as a, as a security attache in, in Germany. So my mom could have had the address and she gave me. So mm. I sent him a letter. And he was very excited to, you know, to, to find my letter and he responded and we planned uh, to meet and uh, we met back in 1985. That is when I saw my dad for the first time and we cried and we loved one another because I understand I was his very, his very first child that he ever got because he met with my mom and when they were very young. But my dad was a polygamist. He had many wives. <laughs> So I was excited to meet him, but now meeting him again, uh, I was also introduced to another life whereby I'm meeting a family. I'm meeting my dad for the first time, but he has many wives and many children. So I met my stepbrothers and my stepsisters for the first time, my step-parents for the first time, and then we started living uh, together. He took me now to a, a good school and... Um, after school, every time I closed school, I was, you know, going uh, to my home area that is in Kisumu. And um, 
Now I was excited, but at the same time, because of that excitement and and because my dad also, since he never met me when I was young, he started giving me a lot of attention, which now caused the others to really feel not okay. This is a stranger who has come, uh, you know, in our home, and the dad is my dad is giving them, giving her all the attention. And it didn't go very well with me. So I also faced rejection. I, I faced uh, a lot of things that really happened in a polygamist, uh, polygamy setup. Mm -hmm. Eventually, I finished my O levels and uh, I was now planning to, to go to university, to college. And instead of my dad taking me to college, he married another woman. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Wife number six. <laughs> Or yeah. is it number one? Yeah, I oh think she was goodness. the wife number six. And this trauma traumatized me, and I thought, you're just a liar. Oh, you yeah. know, because I was expecting too much from him, but he, he didn't deliver. He had promised that he would yes. take you to university. Yeah, he didn't deliver, so I felt, you, you, you're just a liar. Yeah. So I went back to live with my mom, and uh, my mom now continuously, she was doing what she was doing selling you know in a nightclub and moving around with different men and as a young girl at the age of 18 I've, uh, i had already done my all levels I, I felt i needed really to do something so that I could, I could help my mom because i knew she was not doing this because she wanted uh she she didn't have otherwise according to what i thought mm -hmm. so i felt i needed to do something so that i can really uh, deliver my mom from this kind of struggle and I looked for a job. I got a job as a petrol station attendant. And in this place, uh, the owner of this petrol station he looked for young girls who came out from school. And he used to tell us not to wear uniform as petrol station attendant. He, he was expecting us to come to work spot so that now we could attract all the cars that were, were coming. Oh. So that it was a strategic kind of um, thing that yeah. he had. Uh, for clients to come and he looked for beautiful girls. You were all girls? We were all girls. Wow. Yes. So all the cars used to come and you know the clients were very happy whenever we could wipe the, uh, their cars, their vehicles and you know they, they used to be very excited and they couldn't go to other petrol stations they, they to come back. there. Yeah. So it is in this petrol station that I met with the father of my children used to come uh, regularly with a motorbike and he was a young handsome man and with a very you know uh, interesting motorbike those those ones that are high like this he is yeah. a big one <laughs> and at that time you know he's uh, he was a young man that any girl could have admired to be with so he started make, making moves and eventually um, we started a relationship that led now me living with him because he really showed me a lot of love that I was looking for, coming from a background that I went through rejection and I went through a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Here comes somebody who shows you interest and love. I thought, wow, I think I can settle with him so that I can be... And also he had money because many times he brought me uh, uh, gifts and he told me that he was a business person. So I thought, oh, when I get married to this man, I will be able also to help my mom. Yeah. So we started living. Uh, how old were you at this point? At that time, I was 19. Wow. Yes, I was 19. So we started living together. So what happened to, did, did, did the dream of going to school live on or did it die at that time? At that time, I think it died because now I've, I've fallen in love. Yeah. And when you fall in love, something happens. <laughs> <laughs> it's like everything now, you, you're not focused. Yeah. Your mind and everything is centered up upon this, particular person. you know, particular person. And really love can consume, you know. Yeah. Love can really consume and even you, you forget your purpose. So, um, it's like now I didn't look forward to go to school. I've gotten somebody that really uh, fallen in love with and uh, he's really taking me high. And this is a new life to me. So we lived, and uh, I got my first baby, and then my second baby. And it's during the time that I got my second baby that uh, police came, CIDs came in our place, and uh, at around five in the morning, and they ransacked the entire house looking for guns, and we were picked, and we were taken in different police stations. And it's 
this particular time during the interrogation, because I, I think I stayed in, in the police station for t 21 days, being taken from one police station to for another. For 21 days? Yes. Together with this man? For, for him, he was taken in, in a different police station. Yeah. I was taken to in a, another different police station. So it is during that... Um, it is during that particular time that uh, I came to learn who this person was, mm -hmm. because the CIDs, the CIDs told me that uh, the man that I'm living with is my husband is the most wanted criminal in our in our nation. Oh, just hold it right there. We need to take a short break, and then when we come back, we'll find out what happened next. <laughs> 